Uh, good afternoon, Mark. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and for the opportunity to participate in this year's Building Resilience Conference. This is not my first Building Resilience Conference. For those of you who may not be aware, I had the uh, great pleasure of serving as the Assistant Secretary for Infrastructure Protection at the Department of Homeland Security under the Obama administration. Uh, and in fact, DHS uh, was the host of one of these conferences during my tenure. And I was trying to remember, Mark, if it was the conference where I think there was a tornado warning uh, in the middle of the event and we um, contemplated um, hiding underneath the tables that were in the room. But I, I, I need to go back down memory lane a little bit for that one. So it's great to be here. I have had an opportunity to um, participate in a number um, of, of these conferences and I can't tell you how important they are. So thank you for continuing um, to convene. Um, clearly a lot has happened uh, since I left office in 2017. Uh, and there are plenty of challenges, both old and new, uh, that we face and need to address. And frankly, that's why I'm so honored and privileged uh, to be back in government, uh, serving on the tremendous team uh, here at the, the White House. And this is a team uh, under President Biden's leadership and direction that is laser focused on addressing some of the most significant challenges we face as a nation, uh, including tackling the growing threats from foreign adversaries, uh, climate change, protecting and strengthening our critical infrastructure in vital supply chains and bolstering relationships with our allies around the world to restore trust in, in the democratic institutions. <clears throat> As Senior Director for Resilience and Response here at the National Security Council, I can say that while progress in each of these areas depends on many factors, strengthening our, relation, our resilience as a nation is really what underpins all of them. Let me start by saying what we all know, that there is no common single definition of resilience after all of these years. Uh, but I'm gonna start by telling you how I define resilience and how we need to think about what it means for our nation. So when I talk about resilience, I use the definition of, of the, it's about anticipation, identification, um, responding to, uh, recovering from and bouncing forward. That's how I think about resilience. And I think the key terms there are the anticipating and the bouncing um, forward. And, and this is where, um, you know, I will look back at, at how the, the commission on 9-11 kind of framed the failure of imagination. Um, and 9-11 was not just a failure of imagination, but really a failure to, to routinize um, how we use imagination to think about what may be in front of us. And I think as we move forward, building in that healthy paranoia and really thinking about what are the challenges that face us. We have known for a long time that supply chains could be a problem, that climate change could be a problem. We have to do a better job early on embracing and anticipating and identifying those threats. And then certainly as we go through them, how do we build on the lessons learned and not just bounce back, um, but bounce forward and become more you know, stronger and more resilient um, because of it. Let me take that definition of resilience and now um, move into supply chain, the topic of, of um, today's session. Um, first, let me begin by saying this topic has perhaps never been more relevant in our modern era, arguably not since the energy crisis of 1970s or even World War II. Have Americans so severely been impacted by disruptions to our supply chains? Uh, indeed, the COVID uh, pandemic made all Americans acutely aware of our dependence, not only on foreign manufacturing, but also on our global transportation system to deliver goods and commodities that working families needed to thrive and prosper. From toilet paper, if we all can remember back that far, to medical supplies and computer chips, every American has experienced supply chain impacts firsthand over the past year. Then earlier this year, millions of Americans on the East Coast experienced the firsthand impact of a criminal ransomware attack on one of our nation's most important pipelines, an attack that originated beyond our shores, targeted an information technology system, and had far-reaching physical and economic impacts on our nation. So as this group goes, excuse me for a minute. 
as this group knows, <clears throat> gone are the days where we can take comfort in our geographic position alone. We are interconnected and interdependent with the rest of the world, which creates both opportunities and threats. And we need to work together in partnership to address them. I would characterize the events of the past year as a clarion call for action in our geo uh, and President Biden has directed us to act. So let me tell you a couple of things that we are doing right here in the White House now. As many of you are aware, the president signed an executive order, executive order 14017 in February, directing a whole of government approach to assessing the vulnerabilities to um, our critical supply chains and with a call to action to strengthen their resilience. Stemming from that effort, the administration has taken steps to address supply chain vulnerabilities, from expanding the manufacture of vaccines and other essential medical supplies to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, to investments in rare earth mining and processing to improve our nation's cyber security. <coughs> Building on these efforts, the administration released in June findings from a comprehensive 100-day supply chain assessment of four critical products, semiconductors, large capacity batteries, critical minerals and materials, and pharmaceuticals. These reports document a wide range of risk and vulnerabilities to our supply chain's four critical products. Pursuant to the executive order, relevant departments and agencies across the government are now developing comprehensive strategies to address these risks and more broadly to revitalize our industrial base. In line with the overarching theme of the conference, building resilience through public-private partnerships, the president will be convening a global forum on supply chain resi resilience later this year. Our nation's resilience is a shared responsibility, and by working together, our nation will continue to prosper amid a complex and dynamic risk landscape. Together with you, our partners, we will take a whole of nation approach from supply chain resilience to preparedness and response to address the most pressing challenges our nation faces today. And with that, I'd like to now turn to moderating uh, the, pan the next panel, the next decade and beyond. We've had a, we have a great lineup of speakers from across a diverse sector of industries and governments. I've asked each of them today to discuss how they're building resilience within their respective organizations, missions, and functions. So with that, and I do wanna just acknowledge here that we um, are a little bit constrained by time, and I've asked each of our panel participants to try and keep their opening remarks to three to four minutes, and if we have time, um, we can engage in further uh, question and answer but I'm going to turn to Jason Jackson, who is the Vice President of Customer Experience at Infinite Blue. Jason is a highly respected executive thought leader in security, safety, and crisis management and resilient, uh, and sorry, Infinite Blue helps organizations um, develop um, resilience uh, planning uh, and, and strategies. And so, Jason, my question to you is, is both what is your definition of resilience, but what makes the difference between a resilient organization and a less resilient organization? Great. Thank you, Caitlin and, and Mark and the chamber uh, for having me here today. Um, honestly, I go back to your uh, definition of resilience because I think that the words that you use, bounce forward, um, are absolutely fantastic. I mean, simply put, I mean, resilience is simply the capability of an organization or system to be able to adapt, withstand, respond, recover uh, from a difficulty or complexity crisis or disruption. Um, but that bounce forward aspect is absolutely critical in today's day and age. Um, the word in there that I love to use is adapt, um, because I think that that's especially coming off of COVID um, and dealing with this for the last you know, year plus, um, our ability to adapt um, as an organization, as, a, as communities, as a nation, um, as a global partner um, has become more uh, important than ever before. Uh, the 360 degrees uh, around that, of course, um, you know, uh, planning and preparedness and mitigation, identification, response, recovery, all go into that. Um, but this is not uh, yesterday's planning activity. Uh, resilience is active um, and it's an active engagement and it requires organizations to be active in planning for their own resilience. And the days of, you know, having a plan on a shelf and it gathering dust are, well, one, were never acceptable, but 
today, most definitely, uh, as we look forward at the next decade, are most definitely not acceptable. Uh, but as I look at organizations in um, who's resilient and who's not resilient, uh, there's just a few things uh, that I look at. Um, and I, I'll go back to what I just said. Number one is, are they active in their own resilience? Um, and that means, are they applying thought leadership? Have they applied this to the culture of their company? Um, have they invested in people and process and technology to help understand, organize, uh, and also simplify um, how their company or their organization or their agency does resilience? I think the second thing in there, a little more common, um, is really having that comprehensive understanding of their organization, their critical functions, and what is actually required to run that. And you hit on supply chain earlier because this means understanding the upstream and the downstream uh, of, of their interconnectedness and how they work, their dependencies, their partnerships, and everything that makes them run as a whole in the ecosystem. Um, the, the others, the, I think the last couple things for me really come down to the here and the now and how they work through uh, their daily activity. And one is just being aware of their current environment um, and how and when and what impacts them and what it means to that organization and their ability to do that. Um, but the second right behind that is really about their ability to look into the future and look around corners and over the horizon um, at what's coming next. And so as we think about things like infrastructure and cyber and um, more disasters in the future or geopolitical issues, their ability to look forward um, to make sure that they are starting to set their foundations in the stage now to prepare their organizations for that becomes even more important, especially as we look at not just those individual issues, but how they all like they how they stack and 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 the uh, the uh, um, uh, combination uh, of those things all uh, together as potential risks. Uh, like I said, I, I think re resilience itself does not sit still, and neither should organizations. And as a quick shameless plug for the conference in general, um, you know the the notion of public private partnerships and how that plays into community resilience. Um, and how organizations need to think about themselves as part of their communities uh, to make them stronger um, and also to make our nation stronger is equally important. Thank you very much, Jason. And I, I like the concept of, of active and I also appreciate the needing to prepare for the future and look over the horizon. We can't predict the future, but we can certainly imagine what some of the you know possible outcomes are and ensure that we're best positioned to do that. So thank you very much for your comments. Um, I'd now like to move to Scott Gibson, who is the head of strategy and planning for global security at Uber. Uh, in this role, Scott oversees the development and execution of global, uh, the, the global security strategic plan and manages uh, the team's operating rhythm. And um, as we talked a little bit about uh, yesterday, Scott, you know, Uber really is this, um, the intersection of, of human capital and, and, and technology. And so my question to you is that, you know, based on the fact that the, you, know, you really are built on this interface of human capital and technology, how do you um, think about resilience? <clears throat> and what are some of the kind of key principles um, that you embrace uh, as you try to build a resilient organization? Hi, Caitlin. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, it's one we think about a lot at Uber and, and how it presents both opportunities, um, but also when you look at that, intersection of IT and physical, the, the barriers it can create too, and then how we need to think about overcoming those. Uh, in, in many ways, I, I personally see the core of the Uber platform as a means of building resilience in communities at very basic levels. You know, it can provide transportation to those who may not otherwise have access to it or delivery services or alternative means of income if you're considering economic resilience. And in a disaster situation, those capabilities across mobility, delivery, Great logistics, especially of late, uh, enable us to move people to safety or get them essential supplies and services before a disaster uh, and also set them up more quickly uh, for recovery. In the past few years, that's come to fruition in the form of rides to shelters during wildfires, moving PPE on our plate platform during COVID, uh, and more recently partnering with um, the White House on getting people to vaccination sites. So we've, we've been playing this role more and more 
But to your, your question, to your point, uh, there are some inherent barriers that come with that. And it's not just thinking about the resilience of our company, but the platform itself. Uh, and typically, you know, users are going to need access to a smartphone or Wi-Fi, or they need their own transportation to join the app as a driver, or we may be limited by the operability of uh, our own interdependencies, for example, telecommunications. So we've spent a lot of time thinking about how do we overcome these barriers through alternative means of accessing Uber, whether that's how you request a ride or get on the platform as a driver, or even how we can help ensure the individual preparedness of our drivers so that they are able to join the platform and support disaster response and recovery safely. It's, it's kind of a critical component of the Uber kind of ecosystem. If you want to put it in the terms of supply chain, people are a critical component of that. And if we're going to be active and resilient in how we support our communities, ensuring the people on our platform are resilient too is, is equally important. Um, I'll quickly on that note also give a shout out to Rob Glenn and his team at FEMA uh, because we've spoken a lot about how to address some of these challenges and leverage each other's expertise and skills. But overall, you know, I really think it's a glimpse into this next decade of how we're looking at risk and interdependencies. You know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what Bob has to say in a few minutes, but more and more with new technologies and platforms, I feel like we're moving away from industries and services that fit neatly into the critical infrastructure boxes of old that we've focused on for the past couple of decades when we think about assessing risk and building resilience. Um, we have you know, large numbers of small components that contribute to the resilience of communities. Uh, and it's gonna take a heavy amount of coordination to understand what those components are, or how they contribute, how they're interconnected and interdependent with one another. And beyond that, what it's likely going to create is a, a challenge in and of itself just to track everything that's out there that may or may not now be providing some sort of critical service to a community. Uh, so I, I think this next decade is gonna require some reassessment of the landscape in and of itself of what these platforms and services are that are becoming more critical and understand the complexities they're creating and how they're dependent on one another. Um, so ultimately, I, I think that's gonna present a lot of opportunity and how we think about the diversification of resilience. Um, but it comes with some inherent challenges like ensuring we're not creating new single points of failure in our communities, right? So I, I think we have a pretty interesting future ahead of us uh, in many ways for this next decade. But I think it, as much as I agree with the, the definition of resilience that we've discussed, I think how that's now applied in communities is going to take uh, potentially a new way of thinking to make sure we're addressing all the different players in the space now. Yeah. Scott, thank you very much for that. And I want to thank everything that you've done to help make sure that communities are resilient today. Actually, here in the White House, we just kicked off an equitable recovery policy process to really think about the challenges that those um, that are less fortunate and are live in disadvantaged communities have when it comes to responding to disasters and the things that we take for granted, right? And the ability to advocate for ourselves and having access to mobile phones and credit cards and a savings account, it makes it easier for us um, to bounce back. But um, that's not necessarily the case. And so thank you um, for all that you do. And I think as we, you know, think about resilience, we need to remember um, that we've, you know, got critical both workforce, but other communities that we have to account for and keep in mind um, that are key to our communities and the, and the resilience of them. So I appreciate that. I also, I'm glad you got to dress up a little bit in your button, button down shirt. You look very nice. Uh, and I did throw a little bit of an audible. So I thank you for being resilient. I was supposed to go to uh, to Zach next, um, but I actually think your remarks set up um, Zach rather well. Uh, Zach is the CEO uh, at the St. Bernard Project, or SVP, a national organization that is focused on <clears throat> disaster resilience and recovery. Uh, he founded it in 2006 following Hurricane uh, Katrina. I think that we are near the 15-year anniversary, actually, of, of um, Hurricane Katrina. So, Zach, what I'd like to ask you about is, you know, how do you think about resilient? And in your experience, what makes a community 
um, more resilient in the face of a disaster? What are the you know things that they um, do, the, the, the principles that they embrace that may make them more likely not just to bounce back, but, but bounce forward uh, in, in the face of a disaster? Yeah, Caitlin, thank you very much. And thank you for sharing this administration's focus on making sure that all policies have a lens of racial equity. And I think if you think of industries that have been sort of rife with traditional lack of equity, um, you got to think of housing industry. And unfortunately, you can look at the data around disaster recovery. I know we have some great friends at FEMA here, and I applaud the recent FEMA Advisory Committee report that highlights the fact that after disaster, when federal funds are invested, uh, generally white um, communities and white folks increase their net worth while folks of color, and this is when the federal funds are invested, folks of color uh, decrease net worth. So there's a few things that I suppose we suggest. First of all, in terms of defining resilience, um, people have to have the facts and have a, a, a pathway towards understanding and mitigating risk. They have to know how to navigate recovery. And this is not a shameless plug. This is an investment in all of you. Uh, my colleague will put on the chat uh, a link to an Equip app that we made with our partner AT&T that's really designed for people and employees of companies. If you think of business continuity, companies and sophisticated companies now have extremely fantastic technical business continuity plans, but where home is now the office, there's incredible vulnerability around the workforce. And this Equip app we think is one that will allow your team members to again, understand and mitigate risk. Um, so people have to know how to do that. They need to know how to navigate recovery. And fundamentally, it has to work for all. Um, you asked the question, Caitlin, what can local communities do? And I think there's a few things. There's what local communities can do. And then there's the federal framework. I'll start with the federal framework. First of all, it has to be accessible for everybody. We, we know it's not working. There's a couple fixes here. One is a one app. Currently, homeowners have to apply separately three times for FEMA, for SBA, and the eventual HUD season. Just talking about this very thing this morning. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I guess I outed myself that I wasn't there. <laughs> no, double outed myself. Uh, well, SPP has a white paper and we're working on legislation around a one app that would allow folks very simply like FAFSA um, to apply once. And when you think of American citizens who apply, these are people really who are loath to ask for help. It's anathema to who they are. And if they get the least bit of resilience uh, or water on their deed, um, they're not gonna be able to follow through. It's almost built for attrition. Uh, second of all, FEMA damage assessments. The first, if you look at kind of the sequencing of the dollars that come in, FEMA dollars come in, in the first six months, and then the HUD dollars at best hit the ground 18 months to 36 months later. If you look at last year's storms, there still hasn't been a congressional appropriation for HUD CDBG dollars. So FEMA is the first money. And right now FEMA does a, their best to send people to houses or created a new um, phone way of working with people to understand the damage. But it's not working for everybody. It's never worked, it's expensive. The right answer is for FEMA, we believe, to use the same technology that insurance companies are using. We're hoping to pilot that in Louisiana. There's digital imagery, um, there's AI or machine learning, and it can quicker, faster, and as we all know, predictably give people what they need. Um, then if you look at, indeed, what communities can do, they have to know how to play the rules of the, play by the rules of the game. And if we're looking at communities that are able to either get ahead or recover quickly, they're the ones that have the people, resources, the technical expertise to navigate these programs. I can't applaud this administration enough for the BRIC program and the money and infrastructure that's coming, but there's gonna be winners and losers if the local communities can't access this fund, these funds. SBP has um, a recovery fellows program where we place uh, public administrators into at-risk rural and underserved communities and with the goal of accessing those dollars. And we train um, recovery leaders as well to access the dollars and spend them in a way that elevates outcomes 
to the same level of compliance. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks so much for the way you invest your career and the values you have. Thank you very much, Zach. And um, I, we will be following up with you on what you've uh, learned and on the one app. And so um, just look out for an email from me. I'm excited to pull you into what we're doing on equitable recovery. So thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, all right. So just for um, Christopher and Bob, uh, the chamber has been kind enough to let us go a little bit over time. But if you, um, you know, can try and keep your responses for three to four minutes, and then we'll check back and see if we have time for any other questions. Christopher, let me go to you. You are the Enterprise Risk and Sustainability Director at Lockheed Martin. Um, your unit specializes in logistic information systems, automated test equipment, and aircraft ground support equipment. I want to um, talk a little bit about supply chain resilience uh, with you. Um, and you are the defense industrial base. Lockheed Martin is heavily dependent on both the kind of critical minerals and materials that we've been talking about, um, as well as, you know, key parts um, from overseas, some countries that, you know, we consider um, to be our, our greatest strategic threats. Um, how do you think about supply chain resilience and how have you changed your thinking, um, you know, post-COVID and, and um, some of the other developments that have happened related to supply chain risk? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, you know, the defense industrial base has to be resilient to both natural and adversarial risks. Um, so when COVID-19 pandemic started in 2020, we were ready to support our suppliers, especially small and vulnerable businesses, um, with accelerated payments to maintain their cash flow. Uh, the U.S. Department of Defense showed prescient leadership by increasing progress payments on government contracts, and we ensured that benefit flowed to our suppliers. In many cases, suppliers' commercial business dries up in those critical times, so aerospace and defense business is critical uh, to maintaining them. Uh, you know, keeping current suppliers operating through difficult times is really one way to maintain resilience. Um, another specific supply chain resilience action is to detect and prevent counterfeit parts, uh, no matter where they originate. Uh, we included a counterfeit parts-related goal in a recent sustainability management plan. Having trusted assurance of part provenance can be a corporate sustainability issue in our industry. For instance, we've worked with the Air Force on microsurity for trusted microelectronics. I recommend companies explore if this is a material sustainability issue for them as well. Now, relating to your, to your specific question on the critical minerals um, and materials, it's important that the entire supply chain is secure, including processing, refining, transportation, not just extraction. Um, as a supplementary source to meet the demand to power the green economy, uh, seabed minerals can actually offer a greater collection and processing location alternative uh, for geographical resiliency. Uh, finally, I also have to mention multi-tier supply chain cybersecurity because it's not just the physical supply chain that must be resilient. Uh, critical software supply chain components can be just as susceptible to disruption. So strong information security among all participants increases supply chain resilience and will be more important over the next decade. Uh, Christopher, thank you very much for that. I'm now going to turn to our final panelist, Bob Pulaski, um, a longtime friend uh, and colleague who leads uh, the Department of Homeland Security um, National Risk Management Center, um, which facilitates cross-sector risk management approaches to cyber and, and physical threats to critical infrastructure. Bob, um, always nice to be on a panel with you. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, the NRMC thinks about um, thinks about analyzes supply chain risk and how you prioritize where we need to focus our efforts. Sure, Caitlin, it's great to be with you and it's great to be, be with this guest panel and the chamber again. Um, you know, I'll take it up even a level broader and talk a little more than just supply chain resilience. You, you know, I talk risk. We, we, we've set our risk basis around five risk, strategic risk areas. Supply chain is one of those. Another is cybersecurity, particularly with a focus on industrial control systems. She saw that, as you know, Caitlin, the president uh, uh, announced a new industrial control systems critical infrastructure policy this morning, which we were excited to yes. see and look forward to working on. Um, but in addition to that, the pandemic, COVID, climate change and climate change associated impacts 
and then miss dis and malinformation. And so that's the risk basis by which we are trying to be resilient against. We want to be resilient against everything, as you know, but you know, let's start with a, a, a range of risks to, to think about that. And then to, to your question, how do we think analytically of what it means to be resilient? It is around the idea that we have these things called national critical functions that our infrastructure produces. We've identified 55 national critical functions that are available on our website. Things like generating electricity and maintaining supply chains and having the ability to transport goods and materials uh, via cargo, uh, via shipping and, and, and maintaining the financial system, supply of water. Those are the critical functions that need to be resilient. Um, I laid out some of the risk scenarios and we want to understand technically what would make a critical function resilient and actually understand how the function is produced, how the function contributes to economic security, national security, economic competitiveness and community well-being. And, and we're doing the technical work to understand the function. And a lot of what we're trying to do functionally is to recognize that there are going to be vulnerabilities in all of these systems, that the, the, the kind of hazards and scenarios we care about, there's going to be a way that something's going to go wrong, but the whole system doesn't have to collapse. It doesn't have to fail. It doesn't have to fail fast. Going back to the earlier conversation, it can absorb vulnerabilities. It can absorb adversaries or weather, you know, taking down parts of the function because the function is resilient enough to survive. And so I think a lot of the technical work about resiliency is understanding that vulnerabilities don't have to lead to system-wide collapse, um, whether those are vulnerabilities in terms of technologies, software, or hardware. We do a lot of our work in CISA control systems around that, or whether those are vulnerabilities in terms of the availability of supplies, the availability of the workforce, the kind of challenges we had and we still have during the pandemic and related to the pandemic and, and those sorts of things. If the function can withstand the shock scenario, then we're stronger as a country. And when the function can't, that's when we should invest in, in resilience. And that's how I think about the technical work. I can't end a resilience answer without saying the technical work's only part of the answer here. A lot of it is through conferences like this, through public-private partnerships, through interagency collaboration, through working with the non-governmental organizations. Build trust, work through these things on blue sky days, have the relationships so that on black sky days, we're not going to get the, the technical parts exactly right. We're not going to understand the engineering. We're not, we don't know exactly how the scenario is going to play out. We'll do the technical work and then we will react to the technical work through the structures and the public-private partnerships that we put in place to solve problems at, at the speed of the, the manifesting for communities. And I, you know, I, I think all of us contribute to that from where we sit. And, and what I love about this conference is, is that it brings together folks and recognizes that, that, that there's no one lead for being resilient. It is a whole of community effort to use a, a favorite cliche at this point, but, but one that I believe firmly in. Thank you, Bob. I um, would like to pull the string on shock scenarios because it's something that I think um, Jason touched on too, right? Just not how we think about today's threats, but those future threats. I don't know though, uh, I want to turn to my chamber colleagues if we have time, additional time, or if we, it's time to wrap up. And if I don't hear anything, I'm going to pull the string on this. So how do you think about um, the, the shock scenarios, right? So we're not just um, looking at if a function can absorb the shocks, as you said, from today's or yesterday's threats, right? That we're also planning for the future. So how do we get folks um, using some foresight, using some future, something I know a little bit about, um, to make sure we're prepared for, to, for tomorrow as well? Yeah, I mean, I think at this point, that's where you stop studying the thing that can go wrong and you stop, you start studying how things are evolving because how things are evolving is what the people, the adversaries aren't going to catch up with that. So how is digitalization evolving? How, going back to the Uber question, how are we using technology differently? What, what new infrastructure is being developed? Where is their infrastructure under investment? Um, what are geopolitical trends in terms of alliances? you know, what, what is community well-being, those sort of factors will help us understand whether we, we are ultimately going to see emerging risks. Because the emerging risks come from other factors. So don't go chasing after trying to understand the emerging risk. Chase, chase after understand how society is evolving. Get out yeah. of that mindset 
and then you know, do some stress tests. If it's evolving this way, how is it going to change our operations? How would adversaries perhaps get to us? Really try to understand the things that are, what, what, how the things that are critical to, at any level of the organization are evolving based based on those external foresight factors. That's how I approach it. Jason, let me flip it to you, right? How do you get um, organizations to look up and over the horizon as opposed to, you know, what's immediately at hand? Uh, I think, it, it, and again, it goes back to the foundation of understanding their company and where they're going to begin with and, and the, the uh, back to the upstream and downstream of, of all of their interconnectedness and where they plan to be interconnected, which is why this forward-looking conversation uh, becomes so important. Uh, but I, but I, 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 ag I agree with Bob. Um, I think that, you know, it's not always in looking at the risk factors because the reality is if we try to look 10 years down the road, we don't know all the things that are going to happen in that time. And so focusing um, back towards the things that we can control um, and, you know, what's happening within our own environments, what's happening uh, with our partnerships in our communities and how our partners are evolving and getting out of assumptions. And this is why this, again, this conference is so important in sharing ideas back and forth, but getting out of, of, of making sure that or listening to assumptions as opposed to facts of how our friends and partners plan. All right, um, with that, I uh, believe we have run out of time. Um, I do just want to thank you, Bob used the term august, this very august panel. Um, I so enjoy these conferences. They are always a learning opportunity for me. Um, I think it underscores <clears throat> the enormity um, of the complexity <laughs> uh, that we're dealing with and how big the security and resilience challenge is and how uh, and why it is so important that this is a public-private partnership, a whole of community effort. This is not um, something the federal government can solve alone or the private sector or the nonprofit sector. We have to do it together and we do it together by coming um, together to talk through the hard issues uh, and to surface innovative ideas and approaches and um, you know lessons learned. And so I again want to thank the Chamber Foundation, FEMA, DHS, Northcom, all of you um, I look forward to being your partners in this effort uh, over the next uh, four years for sure. Uh, and with that, um, I will turn it back over to our chamber host, Mark. Thank you very much.